Disclaimer. These videos are meant to be a brief overview of the subject. They are written to meet time constraints while still conveying factual historical information. My sources for each video are in the video summary below and can get you started on a more in-depth look at the subject. On a personal note, if there is a way to mispronounce the name, I will do it. It is a gift and I am sorry about it ahead of time. Welcome to Things You Should Know, Civil War Edition. Today we're going to talk about the Second Battle of Corinth, located in Alcorn County, Mississippi, on October 3rd to the 4th, 1862. After the Siege of Corinth in May of 1861, the Union had rebuilt the railroad yards for use for the supply convoys. In addition, the Union had originally built defensive fortifications to protect this area from any Confederate attack from the south or west. It was determined these fortifications were too large and shifted defense to just the area that held ammunition supplies in a junction of two railroads. They called this the Halleck Line. The Union, under command of Major General William Rosencrans, had focused its 23,000 Union defenders in a much smaller area than the Confederates had done 16 months prior. These defenses included the College Hill area that contained the Williams, Phillips, Lothrop, Tanrath, and Robinet artillery batteries. These individual artillery batteries were connected by logs sharpened and arranged for greater defense, an early equivalent to barbed wire. Union General Rosencrantz discovered Confederate Major General Earl Van Dorn and his advancing troops were making a move on Corinth from the northwest. This line of attack also cut Rosencrantz off from any possible reinforcements. Once arriving at Corinth, Van Dorn arranged his men in an arc around northwest Corinth, the Confederate Army was comprised of Major General Sterling Price's two divisions on the left, while Major General Mansfield Lavelle arrayed his divisions on the right. Meanwhile, Union General Rosencrans ordered his men to take up position in the defensive works that faced the Confederate onslaught. The Union skirmish line formed up at the old Confederate entrenchments, the furthest you could get from Corinth. The goal was to attack the Confederates when they reached the Halleck Line, a mile from the center of town. If this was not successful, they would retreat back to the artillery battery positions in and around College Hill. This would force the Confederates to lose strength as they tried to slowly approach Union artillery positions. Battle struck on October 3rd at 10 a.m. when Rosencrans' men pushed into the old Confederate rifle pit. These men were led by U.S. Brigadier General Thomas J. McKean on the left and U.S. Brigadier General Charles S. Hamilton on the right. Rosencrans kept U.S. Brigadier General David S. Stanley in his division back as a reserve force. The Confederate forces moved against the whole Union line, looking for a weak point. Part of Confederate General Van Doren's plan was to perform a double envelopment of the Union forces. They would attack McKean's division on the Union's left from three sides. Van Doren hoped that Rosencrans would move men from his right flank to reinforce Union troops there. If that happened, Confederate General Price could attack Rosencrans' right flank and penetrate what was hopefully weakened defenses. This was partially successful. General MacArthur, no, not that General MacArthur, who was held back for reserve to move his men forward to assist McKean. These moves opened a hole in the line between McKean and Davis, one in which the Confederates pushed into. Unfortunately, during this time, Union Brigadier General Pleasant A. Hackleman, an awesome name by the way, was killed in the fighting while Union Brigadier General Richard J. Oglesby, future governor of Illinois, was gravely injured. Around 3 p.m. that afternoon, General Hamilton was ordered to attack the Confederates on the left flank. Unfortunately, there was a misunderstanding, isn't there always, and so much time was lost that it was sunset before Hamilton's division had reached its starting position for the movement. And because they were so late, the orders had to be abandoned. It is estimated if Hamilton had one more hour of daylight, he could have attacked with his yet unbloodied force and forced Confederate General Van Dorn off the field. Rosencrantz's first day was a failure. He had fielded less than half his troops against the Confederates and squandered opportunities to push them back. Worst of all, he had not coordinated the activities, so the Union forces had to work individually and not as a team. That evening, Rosencrantz observed the situation and moved his troops to form an arch two miles long. He used fortified entrenchments at key points to anchor it. The next morning around 4.30 a.m., Confederate artillery started pounding the Union line of entrenchments and kept this up until 9 a.m. when the Confederate forces moved forward and focused their fighting at Battery Powell. They attempted to force themselves by sheer numbers to break the battery. They charged for a large part of the morning and each time were pushed back by desperate Union forces. During the fighting, Confederate General Dabney H. Murray pushed his troops towards the town. They were having some success, except from Robinette Battery, a Union artillery battery commanded by Lieutenant Henry Robinette, protected by a five-foot ditch and sporting three 20-pounder Parrot rifles. Severe and ferocious hand-to-hand -hand combat commenced, but the Union troops held out and the Confederates had to retreat. Confederate Colonel William P. Rogers, a man who had made a name for himself in the Mexican War with Jefferson Davis, 
was killed as he led the Second Texas during this fighting. It should be noted that Colonel William P. Rogers of the Second Texas seized his colors to keep them from falling again and jumped a five-foot ditch leaving his dying horse and assaulted the ramparts of the battery. When canister shot killed him, he was the fifth bearer of his unit's colors to fall that day. The Confederates soon found themselves the recipient of a Union counterattack that successfully drove them from Battery Powell and then from all of Corinth. By noon, General Van Dorn had determined that he would not be successful and withdrew from the city. The final casualties were 2,525 Union troops, including 355 killed, 1,845 wounded, and 325 captured or missing. Meanwhile, total Confederate casualties were 4,235. This included 473 killed, 1,997 wounded, and 1,765 captured or missing. Please join us again next time on Things You Should Know, Civil War Edition. Mm -hmm.